with you, everyone. It's good to be back down south in Alabama. Uh, I always like to warn my audiences how long these things will take. Um, this should be about uh, 50 minutes, 5-0, so about 30 minutes shorter than a, a Baptist sermon on Sunday, so it <laughs> shouldn't be too big of a deal for you guys. Yeah. Lewis once coined a hilarious term, verbicide, or the murder of a word. What he knew from his studies is that sometimes good words lose their edge. That is to say, over centuries, speakers of the same language sometimes use the same word, but now with what he called a dangerous sense. Wherever we meet a word, our natural impulse will be to give it its dominant sense. When this oper operation results in nonsense, of course, we see our mistake and try over again. But if it makes tolerable sense, our tendency is to go merrily on. We are often deceived. In an old author, the word may mean something different. I call such senses dangerous senses because they lure us into misreadings. Indeed, sometimes one comes to realize that after years of contended misreadings, one has been interpolating senses later than those of the author intended. Even more often, of course, our words change meaning without us even knowing it. We say love, tolerance, virtue, nature, grace, kindness, awesome, honor, and holiness, and we think we mean what our ancestors did. But the meanings of these words have secretly transformed so that we might think that we're in continuity even when we're not. Lewis wrote a whole book of case studies and in various instances of verbicide, but I'm here to tell you that I found the perfect example of what he was talking about, amplification. But in order for you to see what I mean, I need to put before you a few texts, some very recent and some very old. One of the recent texts comes from Cormac McCarthy's long-awaited new novel, The Passenger, released last October. And you'll ha be happy to know that the novel has all of McCarthy's hallmark stylistic features. In particular, there are those passages in which McCarthy, who was a mechanic before his breakout novel was published, out Hemingway's Hemingway. For instance, at one point, the main character, Bobby, fetches his Maserati from a storage shed, and McCarthy writes, the car had a cloth cover over it, and he made his way along the wall to the front and undid the tie straps and folded the cloth back, and carried it outside and shook it out. Then he folded it up and carried it back and put it on the shelf at the front of the locker alongside the trickle charger. He lifted the scuttle and disconnected the clips from the charger and the timer and pulled the wire out through the wheel well and he checked the oil in the water. Then he dropped the scuttle and came around and wedged himself through the door and put the key in the ignition and pushed the starter button." End quote. The prose, stripped even of punctuation, is broken down into something quite literally made up of nuts and bolts of composition. At other points, McCarthy gives us the iconic macho American male. It's still 1980 in the novel, you see. Who obliterates his own self-consciousness through the exercise of the pure power of physics, like some pilot or driver out of a Roy Lichtenstein painting. Take, for instance, when Bobby drives 600 miles from New Orleans to Wartburg, Tennessee, in an evening. Quote, it was dark by the time he reached Hattiesburg. He turned on the lights at dusk, and he drove to the Alabama state line just east of Meridian in one hour flat, 110 miles. It was 70 miles to Tuscaloosa, and the highway was straight and empty except for an occasional semi, and he opened up the Maserati. He opened the Maserati up and drove the 40 miles to Clinton, Alabama in 18 minutes, redlining the engine twice at what the speedometer logged as 165 miles an hour. But then he thought he'd probably used up most of his luck with the state police and the small town speed traps he'd blown through, and he motored leisurely through Tuscaloosa and Birmingham and crossed the Tennessee state line just outside of Chattanooga five hours and 40 minutes after leaving New Orleans. End quote. You didn't realize this talk would be so relevant to things you're interested in, did you? McCarthy is not the only one who describes this visceral experience of power through physics, though. John Updike's Rabbit Angstrom, in the opening scenes of Rabbit Run, decides one night to run away from his loveless marriage. And so he jumps in his car, slams on the accelerator, and starts driving through the night. He doesn't know where he's going, and he doesn't know how long he'll be gone. And the more uncertain he is, the faster he goes. Robert Penn Warren has a great stream of consciousness scene in All the King's Men when Jack Burden jumps into his car and drives from Louisiana to California and back just to give himself a chance to think. 
And my next talk when I get invited again, it will be, why is everyone always driving away from Louisiana? <laughs> but I, I can't address that issue today. Ishiguro's butler in Remains of the Day can only really come to terms with the trauma of his life once he's begun a car trip to the coast. Then there's Jack Kerouac's On the Road. There's time-obsessed Phileas Fogg and Around the Journey, uh, around the, sorry, Around the World, A Journey Around the World in 80 Days, and we could go on. In fact, it would be helpful to me if you could share with me your examples of, of contemporary literature of car traveling or speed traveling. But my point is, as crazy old Filippo Marinetti put it in 1909, we moderns find the forces of technology, he said, more beautiful than Greek statues. We declare uh, the splendor of the world has been enriched by a new beauty, the beauty of speed, a racing automobile with explosive breath, a roaring motor car, which seems to run on machine gun fire, is more beautiful than the victory of Samothrace." End quote. Or consider Roy Lichtenstein's painting. Although classically trained, Lichtenstein rejected traditional painterly conventions, conven conventions which he thought had become stale. Why pretend that we actually like Rubens? Instead of the slow, multi-layered atmosphere rendering of the art of the past, Lichtenstein gave us something new, something we're more comfortable with. Cars ripping through landscapes, obliterating space and outrunning meaning. Pilots at supersonic speed who have the thrill of annihilating their opponents with tremendous forces of megatons. Like the old masters, Lichtenstein did paint monumentally on large canvases. But unlike traditional painters, he intentionally adopted a popular style of representation used for tabloids, advertisements, and comic books, the so-called dot matrix system. And armed with this popularizing technique, he set about to reform every major genre of painting. A weighty still life of a basket of fruit by Cezanne becomes for Lichtenstein this. Or glass of water with lemon. Von Eck's warm interiors, like in the Arnolfini wedding, in which the author proudly paints himself into the mirror, become vacant, clean Manhattan apartments, which mirror and reflect nothing. The traditional portrait becomes the image of some young woman receiving devastating news while projecting a calm exterior. He even vernacularized Picasso and Jackson Pollock, who don't seem nearly so angsty when executed in the dot matrix style. But more to my purpose. Sorry, I'll get back to that in a second. Look at his wham. Lichtenstein knew that old slow paintings don't move us, but amped up action exploding under the ironic gaze of a detached observer do. Lichtenstein frequently portrays macho, invulnerable, emotionally distant, violent men who speed through their lives and their melodramatic relationships with irony while expressing their primal masculinity through the operation of heavy machinery. On the other hand, his wilting females, frail, passive, emotional, also fit the stereotype of modernity perfectly. Lichtenstein is oftentimes called the painter of amplification but he gets that sense of amplification into his paintings by stripping from them any bothersome concerns with beauty or religion or devotion. He just gives us empty space in which bits of passive matter are moved by external energy by collisions. By reducing the number of colors and the delicacy of the balance, Lichtenstein gives us a landscape that reflects back to us only what we bring with us. At the same time though, his paintings feel so comfortable there's so much more familiar than something like this by Rubens. In fact, when I show these, these paintings side by side to my students, they all reluctantly admit that Lichtenstein seems more natural to them than Rubens. It's funny that although Rubens possesses a noticeable complexity of figure and color and layers of background, it feels strangely flat and dull next to Lichtenstein. Lichtenstein's paintings are plugged into an electrical outlet. Next to the glowing screen of Lichtenstein, Rubens seems dull. In sum, we as moderns make and consume art and literature that would have been difficult for our ancestors to understand, let alone like. 
It's an art that seems related to our psychological internalization of the mechanized world picture. A high sounding phrase, I know. Our psychological internalization of the mechanized world picture. But that, by that, what I mean is we take sensual delight in the distilled forces of physics. Mere force and work and acceleration provide us with a kind of electrical voltage of exhilaration. It's the same thrilling pleasure that McCarthy explores as what actually drove the designers of Los Alamos to make the bomb. Or as real life physicist Freeman Dyson put it, quote, I felt it myself, the glitter of nuclear weapons. It's irresistible if you come to them as a scientist. To feel it's there in your hands, to release this energy that fuels the stars, to let it do your bidding. To feel it's there, sorry, to perform these miracles, to lift a million tons of rock into the sky. It's something that gives people an illusion of illimitable power, and that is in some ways responsible for all our troubles. This, what you might call technical arrogance that overcomes people when they see what they can do with their minds, end quote. We're all Oppenheimer, Oppenheimers now. This is from Christopher Nolan's new film that comes out in July on Oppenheimer with Celia Murphy stars. It makes sense why the art and literature of our ancestors is often not moving for us. Maybe it's not though because it's not beautiful or important, but rather it fails because we secretly bring us within us this mindset, what I have called the internalization of the forces of physics. And this is exactly what Lewis was trying to get at when he says that there was an invisible wall that separates us from our ancestors. He says, the beauties which they chiefly regarded in every composition were those which we either dislike or simply do not notice. We must reconcile ourselves to the fact that the praise and censure which we allot to pre-modern poets, only the smallest part would have seemed relevant to those poets themselves." End quote. In other words, if they could hear the critical judgments that we pass in college classrooms and put in Cambridge Companions, they would be astonished by how much we've missed the point. In particular, Lewis has in mind those many tropes and schemes of classical rhetoric. You might remember that you can begin a series of sentences with the same phrase as Churchill once did. We will fight in the land, we will fight in the sea, we will fight in the air. That thing is called anaphora. Or you could repeat the exact phrase in the middle of a sentence and have it double back. Reason your viceroy and me, me, should defend. That's called anadiplosis. Depending on who's counting, there are between 200 and 300 of these things, all of which have ponderous Greek or Latin names, like antithesis, paranomasia, asymptoton, polysyndeton, hysteron, proteron, hyperbaton, etc. In the past, schoolboys spent most of their time not just learning these names, but creating compositions that employed these techniques, and as many as possible, and not just in English, but also in Latin and Greek. For us, piling up such tropes and schemes gives us a feeling of artificiality, and we wonder, why didn't they do something useful with their school time, like calculus too? Lewis comments, we must picture them growing up from boyhood in a world of pretty epinorth epinorthosis, paranomasia, isocolon, and similiter cadencia. Nor were these, many, like many subjects in a modern school, things dear to the teachers but mocked or languidly regarded by the parents. No, your father, your grown-up brother, your admired elder schoolfellow all loved rhetoric. Therefore, you loved it too. You adored Cicero and were as concerned about ascendaton and chiasmus as a modern schoolboy is with football and types of cars. If I can update Lewis's reference just a bit. Our ancestors' stylistic preferences have become for us as inexplicable as their taste in robes and curling wigs. In contrast to the accumulation of complicated rhetorical structures, we moderns like sentences made up of machine-like simp simplicity. We prefer Hemingway to Milton. As Strunk and White put it in a classic college-level book on writing, quote, vigorous writing is concise. A sentence should contain no unnecessary words a paragraph, no unnecessary sentences, for the same reason that a drawing should have no unnecessary lines and a machine, no unnecessary parts, end quote. Because we prefer the ruthlessly efficient mechanistic interaction of gears, wheels, and axles, the sprawling effect of the language of our ancestors seems strange to us. <laughs> 
For Lewis, such an experience of pre-modern literature then was the exact opposite experience of modern machinery. In his Surprise by Joy, for instance, he considered himself blessed because he did not grow up in the world of automobiles. The deadly power of rushing about wherever I pleased, he says, had not been given me. I measured distances by the standard of man, man walking on his two feet, not by the standard of the internal combustion engine. He follows those lines up with this observation. A modern boy travels 100 miles with less sense of liberation and pilgrimage and adventure than his grandfather got from traveling 10." End quote. In sharp contrast to that space-destroying sense of speed and acceleration, he loved his slow walks in the English countryside. When he was a teenager, living at his tutor's house, he was allowed to go for long country walks by himself every day, and especially long walks on Sundays. As I read this, pay attention to what he compares his slow exp experience of the landscape with. Quote, Meanwhile, on afternoons and on Sundays, Surrey, this countryside in England, lay open to me. Total surrender is the first step toward the fruition of art and nature. Shut your mouth, open your eyes and ears, take in what is there. What delighted me in Surrey was its intricacy. The contours were so tortuous, the little valleys so narrow, there was so much timber, so many vi villages concealed in woods. To walk in it daily, gave one the same sort of pleasure that there is in the labyrinthine complexity of Mallory or the Fairy Queen." End quote. I love this passage not only because it's Lewis at his best in describing a landscape, but also because he gives us a precious clue by associating his immersion in the landscape with the experience of reading pre-modern literature. Apparently, to move by foot through the labyrinthine complexity of Surrey, as opposed to tearing through it in a car, evokes something like the feeling of reading Spencer or Mallory, that is to say, an old book. And so, guided by Lewis, let me give you the second example, a pre-modern piece of literature to counterbalance the McCarthy passage I gave you above. What was perhaps Lewis's favorite lyric poem? This one, or a stanza of it from here, Edmund Spencer's Epithalamium. Now, an epithalamium is a now defunct genre of writing but it was common in the pre-modern world. It's a bride song in which the poet imagines a ceremonial procession of the young bride from her house to the church and then to her new home. And then the poem can look toward the future, expressing good wishes and blessings for future fecundity. In this way, the bride, attended by a chorus of bridesmaids, is addressed and accompanied through her transition from her life as a girl to her married life as a matron. Lewis adored this epithalamium of Spencer thinking it, with the exception of one stanza, a perfect poem. Indeed, as he said, it was the greatest ode that had been written since Greek antiquity. And as you might expect, and as you can see, it is rhetorically dense. For instance, Spencer just doesn't use mythological allusions, he has them overlap, so that multiple references are used to capture the likeness of a single thing. To heighten the poetic quality, he stacks up rhetorical techniques on top of one another, weaving them together, to make a complicated net nest of tropes and schemes, the exact opposite of McCarthy's mechanistic prose. In almost every sentence, Spencer uses, uses a device called hyperbaton, a poetic inversion of normal word order. For instance, he says, when ye list your own mishaps to mourn, instead of when you wish to mourn your own misfortunes. Then there are the alliterations, doleful dreariment, mishaps to mourn, then there's the paraphrases, that is the learned roundabout way of saying something. Why say three graces when you can say the junior companions of the Cytherian? You get the idea. The feeling of the whole poem is high or haughty, as Spencer would put it. But by that, he means it as a compliment. Another example of verbicide. The goal of his poem is to teach the woods and waters to echo. In other words, Spencer wants to use all of nature to amplify his voice. The approximately two dozen stanzas of the poem give us overlapping snapshots of the bride on her wedding day. The poem begins by describing the early morning preparation of the bride, and then it zooms in and calls upon the nymphs and trees, the nymphs of trees and springs and caves to come help rejoice. Then it returns to advance the preciously thin plot, now describing her procession 
but then zooming out to consider all the people in the crowd. Then zooming back in to describe the ceremony at the altar and then the bride's procession to her new home. And finally, the poem concludes by praying for a fruitful marriage, expressing the hope that the couple will add saints to heaven's choir. And thus we have circles within circles. The poem begins at the break of day and concludes with nightful rest. In some ways, all of life is this great circle, leading from childhood to adolescence to fruitful marriage in which more children come. And then marriage itself is read as an image of time, a great circling of the ages, an attempt to express eternity. And so what there is by way of plot, as you can see, proceeds very, very slowly. If you come to this with the expectations of speed, you will be disappointed because the focus of the poet keeps panning out and doubling back. The poem does not proceed in a linear way, rather it moves in a kind of rippling pattern of water. I began this talk by talking about the shift in the meaning of words. And now I'm ready to make the point I couldn't have made earlier by providing you, before I had provided you with these examples. What is extraordinary is that Spencer called what he was doing in creating these layered, complicated, slow-moving poems, amplification as well. And how different is his amplification from the amplification of modernity? It's more like a rich reliquary or a medieval chalice, objects which seem so strange and gaudy to us. But the word amplification was used long before the machine age, and as you could guess, it had a different sense. Amplification was an elaborate unfolding within space as opposed to a heightened frequency within time. Amplification was not a hyping up, an acceleration of mass, an increase of momentum, but rather the attempt to render a vision full, generous, abundant, charged with density, alive beyond expectation. Amplification wasn't connected to amps or ampers and getting amped up, but rather it was connected to ample. It was a cornucopia, abundance, gracious fullness, generous abundance. For us in the machine age, amplified writing needs to be stripped down, deliver impact, download huge kilobytes of information fast. For our ancestors, language could luxuriate, grow abundant. We get irritated when it slows down. You're losing the plot, we say to Dante. <laughs> but they seem to love it. Or in a phrase I'll return to, we believe in an amplification of time, while our ancestors were devoted to an amplification of space. What we find in Spencer then is an effort not to rush through to create impact, to do work, but rather to slow time, overcome time, flatten time, or to borrow a phrase from a recent novel, spatialize time. Perhaps you can now see why in his scholarly book, English Literature in the 16th Century, Lewis insisted on translating all of his quotations from Renaissance Latin authors into a mock 16th century English of his own devising. He really thought that there were, he really thought that the world of modernity and the world of pre-modernity were as different as say our world is from Narnia. They're two different universes. It's surprising to see how much he thought things had changed even over a couple of generations. Comparing the early 20th century to the Dark Ages in his 1954 address, he commented wryly, if one were looking for a man, oh, that's not my quote. If one were looking for a man who could not read Virgil, though his father could, he might be found more easily in the 20th century than in the 5th century. Indeed, Lewis made the claim in the same lecture that the greatest rupture in all of, histor in all of history in all of time had been that which had occurred at some point in the late 19th century. Pause to consider that claim. The barbarian invasions, the conquest of Alexander the Great, or even the advent of Christianity, none of them brought cultural change as dramatic as that, what, as that which separated C.S. Lewis from his grandfather's generation. In that great lecture, Lewis provided three reasons to support that monumental claim, including this one. Lastly, I play my trump card. Between Jane Austen and us, but not between her and Shakespeare, Chaucer, Alfred, Virgil, Homer, and the Pharaohs, comes the birth of the machines. This lifts us up at once into a region of change, far above all that which we have hitherto considered. This is on a level with the change from stone to bronze, or from a pastoral to an agricultural economy. It alters man's place in nature." End quote. 
As you can see in this passage, Lewis thought that we moderns had now spent so much time around our machines and so little time in the natural world that the way we see and feel about the world had fundamentally been altered and that these changes had now entered so deeply into our psychology that the very way in which we used language had changed. He wondered, for instance, why do we use the word stagnation, a word that has overtones of malaria and swamps, whereas our ancestors would have said permanence? Why is it that we use the word primitive? When we use the word primitive, we instantly feel connotations of clumsiness, inefficiency, and barbarity, whereas our ancestors talked about the primitive church or the primitive purity of a constitution, and by that they meant pure and vital. And then my personal favorite, why does latest and advertisement mean best? The answer is, according to Lewis, is that now the image of old machines being superseded by new and better ones has become for us the controlling archetype of our imaginations. Machines and technologies are so important for us as moderns that they mark for us the great milestones of our lives. There's your marriage, the birth of your children, and the year you got your first iPhone. In other words, what sets us apart, not just from our grandparents' grandparents' generation, but from all the rest of human history, is what you might call the psychological internalization of the mechanized world picture. That is, the expectation has got into our blood and our bones that we need to amp up our lives, live our lives more and more like machines as opposed to the seasons of nature. Or as George Eliot put it in Middle March, Although she wished she could write like Fielding, who would, quote, chat with us in all the lusty ease of his fine English, she can't. The world has changed. Quote, Fielding lived when days were longer, when summer afternoons were spacious, and the clock ticked slowly in the winter evenings, end quote. It's this expectation, not just of speed, but of acceleration, that separates us most sharply from our ancestors quoting Lewis, and whose absence would strike us as most alien if we could return to their world. Conversely, our assumption that everything is provisional and soon to be superseded, that the attainment of goods we have never yet had, rather than the defense and conservation of those we have already, is the cardinal business of life, would most shock and bewilder them if they could visit ours." End quote. What wonderful lines if we could return to their world, or if they could visit ours. Indeed, Lewis himself seems to have taken up the idea because in his fictional writing, more than once he stages encounters between past and present. For instance, in that hideous strength, Lewis imaginatively puts the high priest of the ancient symbolic cosmos, Merlin, in dialogue with the virtuous but drab Ransom. And poor Merlin is completely shocked and bewildered. Because although it has a, our world has a legion of physical comforts, it lacks meaning, order, and hierarchy. In a way, our, order, our world has traded order and harmony of the ancient world for the speed and forces of modern physics. And so in a wonderful passage from that hideous strength, Lewis memorably illustrates this great divide. When, when Ransom finally makes Merlin understand that their plight is so desperate, that they would have to risk their bodies by exposing them to the powers of deep heaven. Merlin desperately cast about for more prudent alternatives. He asked this, that Saxon king of yours who sits at Windsor now, is there no help in him? Ransom replies, he has no power in this matter. Is it then, Merlin continues, his great men, the counts and legates and bishops who do the evil and he does not know of it? It is, though they are not exactly the sort of great men you have in mind. But what about the true clerks? That is the, uh, the clerics. Is there no help in them? It cannot be that all your priests and bishops are corrupted. Then Ransom painfully adds this. The faith itself is torn in pieces since your day and speaks with a divided voice. Even if it were made whole, the Christians are but a tenth part of the people. There is no help there. Then let us seek, Merlin continues, then let us seek help from overseas. Is there no Christian prince in Nestruria or Ireland who would come and cleanse Britain if he were called? There is no Christian prince left, 
then we must go to him whose office is to put down the tyrants and give life to dying kingdoms. We must call on the emperor. There is no emperor. No emperor? began Merlin, and then his voice died away. Presently, he said, this is a cold age in which I have awaked, end quote. Poor Merlin. Although we tend to pity our ancestors for not having iPhones and jet planes, we see that through Lewis's imaginative dialogue, how they would look upon us with wonder and shock and pity. But then Merlin lands on one last desperate idea. What if we went beyond European Christendom to the Far East? Could we find help there? There it is. Ransom shook his head. Quote, the poison was brewed in these Westlands, but it has spat itself everywhere by now. However far you went, you would find the machines, the crowded cities, the empty thrones, the false writings, men maddened with false promises and soured with true miseries, cut off from earth, their mother, and from the Father in heaven. Is it then the end? asked Merlin. We can sympathize with Merlin, can't we? He went to sleep in a world that felt like the universe was a great cathedral and was saturated in spiritual essence, an iconic world, a symbolic world, a sacramental world, and he was awakened in our world that was already becoming our culture of 24-7 news and trends and feeds and its unending series of crises. Or as Lewis himself put it, we live in the age of govertisement, that is, government by advertisement, in which the organization of mass excitement is the normal organ of political power. We live in an age of appeal drives and campaigns. Our rulers have become like schoolmasters and always demanding keenness. And you notice that I am guilty of a slight archaicism in calling them rulers. Leaders is the modern wor word. I have suggested elsewhere that this is deeply significant change in our vocabulary, verbicide, right? Our demand upon them has changed no less than theirs on us. For a ruler, one asks justice in corruption, diligence, perhaps clemency. Of a leader, dash, initiative, and I suppose what people call magnetism or personality." End quote. I'd now like to move into the final part of this talk and show how, if we keep all these things in mind, we can see how Lewis's bizarre sci-fi thriller, That Hideous Strength, the third and final volume of what is often called the Space Trilogy, can be thought of as a kind of battle between these two types of amplification. The story begins with what should have been a boring college meeting in a sleepy, quaint college English town, the imaginary Edstow. At the college meeting, the topic up for debate is whether the college should sell its traditional wooded property. But the debate is not exactly fair. The progressive element has been planning for this vote for a long time. And when the day of the decision arrives, through a coordinated series of acts of manipulation, ad hominem attacks, pre-meeting canvassing of votes, the college votes to sell the wood to the National Institute for Coordinated Experiments. The nice. The few traditionalist opponents are pilloried as diehards and caricatured as absurd curmudgeonly conservatives who, quote, passionately desire to see Bragdon Wood surrounded with barbed wire. The world is now the world is now moving so fast that to stay still seems reactionary. But the nice has very ambitious plans for freeing England from its traditional backward ways. They have their own police force. They have their own prisons. They have journalists planted in almost all of the major news outlets. And they have educational specialists who are going to reform schools. Indeed, in a telling moment, in a backroom conversation, one of the progressive members of NICE, Lord Featherstone, says to the man he's trying to recruit, if science is given a free hand, it can now take over the human race and recondition it. It can make man a really efficient animal. Lord Featherstone's interlocutor, Mark Studdick, asks, but how will science transform the human race? Lord Featherstone answers, quite simple and obvious things at first, sterilization of the unfit, liquidation of backward races, selective breeding, then real education, including prenatal education. By real education, I mean one that makes the patient what it wants infallibly, whatever he or his parents try to do about it. Of course, it'll have to be mainly psychological at first, but we'll get on to the biochemical conditioning in the end and direct manipulation of the brain. A new type of man, and it's people like you who have got to begin to make him." End quote. It's really weird and futuristic, isn't it? <laughs> 
So far, this might not sound all that different from that Netflix series you stayed up too late watching last night. Stop me if you've heard this one before. A group of bad men in nicely cut suits decide to take over the world from their international corporate headquarters. But this is where Lewis does do something completely different. In your beloved Netflix series, who opposes the bad guys? You need some sort of machine using genetically enhanced super spy, right? A Jason Bourne, a James Bond, or maybe one of the X-Men. You need someone to fight fire with fire, technology with technology, good machines against bad machines. But in C.S. Lewis, the group that will save the world is, wait for it, a group of college professors of medieval literature. Let's go! You see why I like the book. Pause to consider the absurdity of this situation. On the one side, you have infinite amounts of capital. Ab you're able to buy politicians, corrupt local officials, plant journalists, manipulate public opinion. On the other side, you have some old-fashioned academics who read medieval versions of King Arthur stories. Philologists who are experts in languages that don't exist anymore. Who's going to win this fight? Doesn't it seem a little hopeless? But we've already seen for Lewis how on one side of the equation are the forces of modernity, which use speed, power, engines, machinery, technology to transform the created world into anything we desire. On the other side of the equation, we have intricacy, slow, open-minded attentiveness, summed up by a walk through the English countryside or the reading of pre-modern Arthurian literature. In other words, this unlikely band of middle-aged heroes and their graduate students has access to something that the machine-using, technology-obsessed members of NICE don't. Qualitative things, values. That is, they're tuned into spiritual realities that lie outside of the domain of the forces of physics. And it is for this reason that the old Arthurian wizard Merlin comes into the story. Ransom, the leader of the band, who speaks excellent Latin, by the way, enlist Merlin's assistance in conducting a terrifying seance. Ransom and the now dug up Merlin one night go up into a tower of the house and are visited by the supernatural intelligences that make up ancient astrology. How's that for Netflix? The pure spiritual intellects of classical mythology descend, drawing all the affairs of the household into their spiritual field. Mercury comes to visit them, and when he does, the whole household erupts in uproarious talk, outrageous banter, puns and jokes and arguments of ridiculous complexity. Here's what Lewis says paradoxes, fancies, anecdotes, theories laughingly advanced, yet on consideration well worth taking seriously, had flowed from, from them and over them with dazzling prodigality." End quote. Next, at Venus's arrival, the inconsolable wound with which man is born waked and ached at this touching. Mars comes, breathing into all a joyful, masculine, militant sense of confidence and camaraderie and fellowship. Their love for one another became intense. Each, looking on the rest, thought, I'm lucky to be here. I could die with these. Saturn brings feeling of depth and visions of height and profundity and thoughts tinged with cold melancholy of eternity and of time before Jupiter arrives to cast a spell of ceremony, pomp, and festivity. And so what we have are the forces of the old world brought to those who love the slow, the rich, the meaningful, and thus are in tune with qualities, not just forces. They're in tune with courage that unfolds in friendship, loyalty that is willing to spill blood, love that treasures the beloved, joyful exultation and contemplative depth. And they will have to go up against the forces of modernity. And as you know, it is precisely those who have access to the old slow things who do win, and they will win because they have access to a kind of amplification that the modern world knows nothing about. And so, although Lewis knew that the pleasure of accelerating masses of metal makes up part of our DNA, and that it's in our nerves and in our bloodstreams, and that as a consequence, the amplification of old books strikes us as strange. Indeed, it would be strange if they didn't. Nevertheless, he also thought that we might be the strange ones. And so why read old books? Lewis's answer was this, because our ancestors in their slow, eternity-hungry culture had ears alert for what was behind time. Oops, <laughs> that's like, like a Freudian slip right there. Let me slip back into Venmo and PayPal world. Um, okay. <laughs> 
Our ancestors in their slow, eternity-hungry culture had ears alert for what was behind time. They wanted to overcome time, not smash the accelerated accelerator pedal to the ground to forget it. They thought that the eternal world of God was lurking, as it were, just outside of time, eager to make itself manifest within time. And when it did, it felt too much. It was a thing of height and depth, a thing of overwhelming goodness and beauty. And that is the thing they tried to gesture at in their complicated, elevated, exuberant, but difficult art. In a phrase, they were trying to spatialize the temporal.